Thank you, thank you very much. And I take this opportunity to uh, thank again, I've done that while you were in Brazil. I'm happy to do it publicly now, which is to thank you from the bottom of my heart for extending this invitation from the Frobenius Institute and giving me the opportunity of sharing my thoughts with uh, this wonderful audience. I've done that uh, already four times and I am very much looking forward to the to three more times and I will miss after this our uh, weekly uh, uh, rendezvous, uh, obviously. And thank you all for coming and I'm seeing friends who could not come until now but today have made it. It has to do with God. I think that <laughs> Whenever you say the word God, he summons people from all over the place, even if they are in Brazil, to listen to his word. Now, I will start this conversation on translating the word of God by uh, reading you two pages from a, classical, a classic of African literature. I won't say which, I will just let you recognize it, I guess, after the first couple of lines, you will know what it is. So let me keep the surprise for the time being and do some quiz after that. Here is the text, and you will understand why I'm starting with it in this uh, lecture. That day, Cherno had beaten him again, and yet Sambayalo knew his sacred verse. I'm seeing some light in some eyes from these names. It was only that he made a slip of the tongue. Cherno had jumped up as if he had stepped on one, on one of the white hot paving stones of the Jehenna promised to evil doers. He had seized Sambayalo by the fleshy part of his thigh and between his thumb and index finger had given him a long hard pinch. The child has gasped with pain and begun to shake all over. Threatened by sobs which were strangling him in the chest and throat, he had had the strength to master his suffering. In a weak voice, broken and stammering, but correctly, he had repeated the verse from the holy book which he had spoken badly in the first place. The teacher's rage rose by one degree. Ah, so you can keep from making mistakes. Then why do you make them? Why? The teacher had let go of Sambayalo's thigh. Now he was holding him by the ear and cutting through the cartilage of the lobe, his nails met. Although the little boy had often submitted to, his, to this punishment, he could not hold back a slight groan. Repeat it again, again. The teacher had shifted the grip of his fingernails and they were now pursing the cartilage at another place. The child ear, already white with scarcely healed scares, was bleeding anew. Sambayalo's whole body was trembling and he was trying his hardest to recite his verse correctly and to restrain the whimpering that pain was resting from him. Be accurate in repeating the word of your Lord. He has done you the gracious favor of bringing his own speech down to you. These words have been veritably pronounced by the master of the word. And you, miserable lump of earthly mold that you are, when you have the honor of repeating them after him, you go so far as to profane them by your carelessness. You deserve to have your tongue cut a thousand times. Yes, master, I ask your pardon. I will not make a mistake again. Listen, once more, trembling and gasping, he repeated the flashing sentence. His eyes were imploring. His voice was fading away. His little body was burning with fever. His heart was beating wildly. This sentence, which he did not understand, for which he was suffering martyrdom, he loved for its mystery and its somber beauty. This word was not like other words. It was a word which demanded suffering. It was a word come from God. It was a miracle. It was as God himself 
had uttered it. The teacher was right. The word which comes from God must be spoken exactly as it has, it has pleased him to fashion it. Whoever defaces it deserves to die. Of course, most of you have uh, uh, recognized here the opening two pages of, let me try this in German, the sweet spalt des Sambayalo, or uh, l'aventure ambiguë in French and the ambiguous adventure in English, written by Senegalese writer uh, uh, Sheikh Amidou Khan. Uh, and you see the reason why I'm starting with these two beautiful and strange and unsettling pages. That scene between the child named Samba Diallo and the teacher of the Quranic school called Cherno here is then from L'Aventure Ambigu. It should be noted that the child is submitted to such a barbaric treatment because he is the favorite student of the teacher. You see what it means to be the favorite teacher, student of the teacher, don't try too hard. He must be perfectly disciplined as he deserves to embody the word of God. And one of the central passages of the novel is the moment when during his night of the Quran, he recites from memory for his parents and the whole household the totality of the book, thus manifesting that he has become a hafiz or a preserver of uh, the book. I wanted to cite that powerful opening of a classic of African Francophone literature as an introduction to what I'm interested in, which is the philosophical and theological and also political question of what it means for a text to be spoken by God, in other words, to have been, and this is my own angle on it, to have been vertically translated from the infinite to the finite, from the eternal into the finite and temporal receptacle of a human language. And that question leads naturally to that of the sacred language, uh, which is then the one that God spoke. Is that sacredness an exclusive essential attribute of the language that has thus been elected? Did that election create its sacredness or did it just manifest what was already its sacred nature? I have called the descent of God's word into a human language a vertical translation because I want to examine it in connection with then what I would come to call horizontal translations of the word into other human languages that do not share in the same sacredness. Or do they precisely share in the same sacredness? Did Latin, for example, become somewhat sacred when it received the word through that kind of horizontal translation. That seems to be the case for those who are deeply attached to it as the liturgical language of Christianity. Uh, Senghor was one of those. Senghor would not go to mass if it was not a mass in Latin. Given that vertical translation divides human languages into those that are sacred and chosen and those that are not, is horizontal translation permitted and simply possible? Those are the few questions I want to pose in this lecture. Uh, first, looking at the theology of vertical translation from the infinite to the finite, then at the theological political implications of what I have called horizontal translation from the sacred language to the lay ones. So first point, the theological question of divine translation. <clears throat> in, in what sense, in what sense is sacred scripture said to be the word of God is the question posed in all three Abrahamic uh, uh, religions, in all three religions of the book, if you want to use that expression, 
uh, which is the Islamic phrase by which Judaism and Christianity are designated, and which of course applies as well to Islam itself. Maybe Islam is par excellence the uh, religion of the book. Uh, such a theological and philosophical question is the title of Spinoza's chapter 12 of his Tractatus Theologico Politicus in which he writes this, I quote uh, Spinoza. They who hold the Bible as it is to be the handwriting of God sent from heaven to man will doubtless exclaim that I am guilty of the sin against the Holy Ghost in concluding that it is in parts imperfect, corrupt, erroneous, and inconsistent with itself. <laughs> Scripture also is sacred and its doctrines are divine so long as it moves mankind to piety towards God. But if it comes to be almost entirely neglected, as it was at one time by the Jews, it is nothing more than ink and paper. It may then indeed be profane and obnoxious to corruption. And if under such circumstances it is corrupted or perishes, it is a false phrase to say that it is the word of God which is corrupted or perishes. In the neglect of its precepts, it has ceased to these men to be the word of God. Even as in the time of Jeremiah, it was incorrect to say that the building which, perishes, which perished in the flames was the temple of the Lord. Now, reading together the passage from the African novel, L'Aventure Ambiguë, and this passage from Spinoza's treatise, Tractatus Theologico Politicus, shows that in both cases, but in different ways, vertical translation of the word of God can only mean its embodiment in the human being. For Spinoza, the word is that of God when it is living and lived by being incorporated, embodied, so that it translates into piety. When it is manifested by piety, it is truly the handwriting of God in the heart of the believer. When it is not thus incorporated or embodied, then like everything sensible, it is just generated and therefore bound to corruption. Just like the temple of the Lord deserted by true believers is a simple perishable building, the tables of a law not respected are simply pieces of stone. After all, and this is the starting point of this theological question, how could Moses, even at the height of his anger, have decided just to destroy the very word of God that he had received on the table? This was a very interesting theological <coughs> question. And this is, that is the question that Spinoza poses at the beginning of this chapter. Maybe to understand this, you remember the, the wonderful Charlton Heston movie of the Ten Commandments, when God uses his own laser hand to write down vroom, with that magnificent Hollywood sound, his law on the, on the, on the pieces. And then he is uh, 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 kind enough to just frame it and then detach it so that Moses can carry it and bring it to uh, uh, Bani Israel, the, the, the children of Israel. And then one could not imagine, and this is what happens in the movie, that out of anger, he just took the tables and broke them. Even if I am really, really in anger, if I am carrying my daughter, I am not going to throw her away in the height of my anger. So how could Moses do that to the very word of God to which he should be uh, uh, attached and for which he should be even more careful than me with my daughter. That's one way of translating into simple language the theological question here. So the, to that important theological question, Spinoza answers very simply, Moses could do that because it was not the word of God anymore, anymore, 
but just corruptible inscriptions on breakable tables from stone. Or as he said earlier, then the book is just ink and paper, is nobody is there to make it alive as the word of God. <clears throat> Strictly speaking, the word of God can only descend not on stone, but into what is of the same nature, namely the heart of the believer. Or, according to philosophers, into the human intellect or pure prophetic faculty. Here you have two languages. You can have the language of the mystic, speaking of the heart of the believer as being the true receptacle for the word of God, or you can go along the path of the philosophical language who translated their own faith into Aristotelian and Neoplatonist uh, uh, language and talked about the intellect, the human intellect receiving uh, uh, it. Which means that from the realm of the intelligible and the divine, it enters the sensible when its uncreatedness is translated into our created words and its eternity is translated into our temporality. Now, the Islamic religion is founded upon the narrative of the descent of the Tanzil. Tanzil is one of the other names of the Quran, and it means descent. Of the descent at once of the book, or the word of God, into the prophet's heart, although he was illiterate, illiteracy meaning in this case that he was pure receptivity, a kind of blank slate for God's handwriting, as if in this case, God's laser finger did not write on stone, but directly on uh, uh, the prophet's heart. Then it will take the message he received that way, 23 human years to unfold, fragment after fragment, verse after verse, literally out of the prophet's body. And you find in, in, uh, in the literature, in the tradition, Islamic tradition, many, uh, uh, many narratives about the way in which it, it would be even painful for the prophet to receive the revelation as if it was coming out of uh, uh, his, his body. From the first Quranic verse commanding to read or to recite, to the last one proclaiming that God is oft forgiven. So what first happened in one single moment, in one single fiat, where the text is written out of time, so to say, in some kind of pre-eternal single moment into the heart of the prophet, then uh, 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 was translated, to use my language, into the sounds, then letters and words bound together into what we know as the Quran, thus transforming this kind of piercing of eternity into duration in time. So after having said that this question of what it means to, for a text to be the word of God and what it means to translate it, as you have seen, I have more focused on the Islamic side of it after having quoted Spinoza, but I'll come to the Bible uh, later. Now, it should be noted that the Quran itself, the, 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 the book, the Muslim book, which is often very self-referential, the Quran doesn't stop speaking about the Quran, about itself, about its language, and so on, insists on the fact that the mother of the book, there is an expression in the Quran itself referring to the mother of the book. And in few verses, it looks like it is the Quran itself. In other verses, it seems to be referring to a book that remains eternally with God. As if to say that the creative matrix itself continuously remains in the realm of the divine and the intelligible, where from the word has proceeded to descend into the sensible. One question that could be posed then is, should we then consider that there is a duality, some kind of duality, when we would have a word that would remain whole and eternal with God, 
while projecting, so to speak, its shadow into the created word of becoming. This would be classical Platonist or Neoplatonist type of language. Now, against that reading, in a self-referential declaration again, the Quran insists that the revelation is complete, that it has indeed descended in its totality, and that nothing was lost in that vertical translation, as I've called it. That is exactly the theological position being expressed by the master Cherno in the pages from L'Aventure Ambiguë that I read on an issue that was a theological issue in the history of Islam that was raised in the Muslim world as early as in the last uh, uh, third of the seventh century, towards the uh, uh, end of the seventh century. And this issue is known as the controversy of the created versus the uncreated word of God. <coughs> that issue and the controversy in question gave birth to many, to at least two uh, schools in speculative theology in, in Islam. Sorry. Here, here is how I would state the question and the issue. Can we really think that the word of God as transcribed into the letters and words of a book can share God's eternity? That was the question posed by the most rationalist theologians in the Muslim world. Now, on the other side, you would have, you would have the, most, the more literalist uh, uh, theologians who would insist that this is truly the word of God, just like the master Cherno in uh, uh, the novel. Now, one could ask the following question. Wasn't, in fact, that question and the disputatio ultimately just about words? After all, we could all agree that it is in the very nature of our created word that when, even when the eternal descends into it, it will get ipso facto translated into the created beings that letters and sounds are. And there is a tradition about the fact that what distinguishes the prophetic faculty is also the imaginative faculty. In other words, the capacity to translate the intelligible into images and images that could be offered to the understanding of the human being. To the alternative then, created versus uncreated would respond one single concept, the concept of translation. Instead of talking in dual terms of whether created or uncreated, you just say, well, it is in the nature of things that when the eternal enters the temporal, it translates itself into the temporal. When the language of God enters the realm of the human being, it translates itself into human uh, 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 language. So those who held the rationalist position were not saying anything different. Their position amounted to saying that the word of God translated itself into a word for the humans that they could hear, read, understand, a word that was offered to their capacity to comprehend. Jewish philosopher Moses ben Maimon or Maimonides was part of that debate. We should remember that actually Maimonides could be considered just an Arab philosopher among, well, an Arab speaking philosopher among the other Arab speaking and writing uh, philosophers. And he was, this was his own intellectual atmosphere. And this theological debate was the debate about which he, uh, uh, he wrote. And he commented that issue, which was a burning issue in the, in the uh, realm of uh, uh, Islamic theology, he commented on that question in the chapter 26 of his Guide of the Perplexed, the Talmudic maxim that, I quote, the Torah speaks in the language of man. So beyond serving as an explanation for certain clearly anthropomorphic attributes of God, 
it certainly also means that the word of God was created, translated into the language of the children of Adam, as Maimonides says in his uh, uh, commentary. And it is very interesting to uh, say a couple of words about those commentaries because Maimonides here is also discussing uh, the general issue within which the question of the word being an attribute of God is posed, which is the question of attributes themselves. What are the attributes when we look at them in relation to the essence of God? Because attributes are plural. Some of them may be clearly anthropomorphic, but one could say that somehow they are all anthropomorphic. If I say that God is hearing, well, it would be different from the way in which I hear. If he, I say he's speaking, or even if he's living, his life would have nothing to do with my life, and so on and so forth. To which Maimonides said, well, we have to remember, even if it is the word of God, it is a word for humans. He is talking to us. In other words, how would he call himself when he is alone with himself? We will never know the nickname he gives to himself, okay? But when he talks to us, then he presents himself as the beautiful, the living, the, the hearing, the speaking, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. <clears throat> that would be an illustration of what I have discussed earlier in my previous uh, uh, lectures about the notion as the notion of the untranslatable. Here we would have we would be witnessing the untranslatable uh, par excellence, in other words. Everything that is naming of God would be, by definition, untranslatable, and the only way in which those could be translatable is if they refer to our own human language. That was uh, the questions I wanted to raise concerning what I have called uh, the theological notion of the vertical translation. Now let me move to a second uh, uh, part of my uh, lecture, which is the theological political question now of translating from the sacred language. Not just now the vertical translation, God to us as human beings, but once his word has been received by a human language, the horizontal translation into other human languages. So I turn to the language of the children of Adam, precisely, and ask what the implications for the linguistic receptacle uh, are. What does it mean for a human language to be sacred and thus set apart from those that are not? To be, to be precise, what does it imply as the Quran itself uh, uh, declares that uh, uh, it has descended in clear Arabic language? And this phrase in clear Arabic language is repeated again and again in uh, the Quran, bilisan in Arabi and mubin. So the text declares that what descended into the heart came out in plain Arabic for people to receive it. Interestingly, another Quranic verse makes reference to those who opposed the claim of the prophet of having received a revelation by accusing him of simply carrying the words that he had translated from some kind of mysterious, mysterious teacher, secret teacher called Rahman and pretending that they were from God. It is interesting, this is a tradition that you find in Islam, the people who opposed the revelation in the first place, oh, oh, don't pay attention, this is beautiful poetry, but what he is doing is just translating into Arabic some teaching of a hidden secret teacher of his called Rahman, uh, which is one of the name of God. Rahman means the merciful. Uh, an accusation to which then the Quran replies on behalf of its prophet that while the language of that hidden teacher is foreign, Ajami, the words uttered by the prophet are clear Arabic, using here the same phrase uh, as earlier. I'm just uh, mentioning this because I'm interested in two notions that are implied here. First notion which is central to the Muslim faith that of the inimitability of the Quran. Uh, 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 in that utmost clarity and self-evidence. And according to Islamic tradition, actually, 
this Quran is the only true miracle claimed by its transmitter. Second notion I'm interested in, that of a difference and separation between Arabic and non-Arabic, Arabic and Ajami, Ajami meaning non-Arabic. Depending on how they are understood, these two notions could either lead to the idea that it is because of its sacredness that a language has been eternally, so to say, chosen to be the receptacle of the word of God, or on the contrary, to the understanding that a language is in fact made sacred by receiving the word of God. These are two different ways of understanding what it means for a language to be sacred and apart from other languages. Now, before I come back to that, let me show on an anecdote what is at stake here politically, I would say. And this is what was actually the starting point of my reflection on what it means to translate the word of God. Under the supervision of Dr. El Hajj Rawanbay, who is a renowned professor of Arabic and Islamic studies at uh, Sheikh Antajob University in Dakar, who is now retired, a Wolof translation, a translation in Wolof, Wolof is my language, it is the most widespread language spoken in Senegal. This Wolof translation of the Quran was completed. So Elash Rawan Gom, Elash Rawan Bay, offers all guarantees of being very knowledgeable in Islamic studies, in Arabic, and so on, so forth. And he completed with a wonderful team of his a translation into Wolof of the Quran. Now, there is an official institution in Saudi Arabia whose task it is to control and publish translations of the book into the many languages spoken in the very different and diverse Muslim societies. One good reason for asking that institution to publish a translation is that its imprimatur is highly valued and also that institution has enough resources to publish translations at no cost, actually, for the buyers. You can even offer uh, them. So Dr. Rawan May and his team uh, 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 went to that institution asking for their support for publication. Now, they found themselves confronted with all sorts of evasive responses and delays. And the professor, Rawan Bay, who is uh, uh, a mentor of mine and a friend, who knows very well what the thinking behind that evasiveness, he has been for many years, actually, uh, the, the, the commissaire of the pilgrimage to Mecca. So he is very familiar with the scene in Saudi Arabia. So he told me two things. First, that there is an instinctive suspicion vis-a-vis -vis the very notion of translating the Quran into a foreign language, whatever that language. Anyway, in the first place, that is something general. And second, that such wariness is amplified in the case of African languages. There is some kind of entrenched idea that our African languages, Rawan Bay told me, have something inherently and irreparably pagan that would inevitably corrode the purity of the language. In other words, in this particular case, his thinking was that to the wariness about translation in general and the politics of translation was added some kind of prejudice vis-a-vis -vis African languages. The belief in a division between chosen language and foreign i.e. pagan or barbarian language, which dictates the attitude in the face of translation, implies, and this is generally speaking, that there are languages more appropriate than others in their very essence to receiving the word of God, or even to simply deal with divine realities, with prophecy, etc. Linguistic ethnocentrism is probably widespread in all human societies. It is most present and central in imperial uh, situations. For example, when colonialism makes the success of its civilizing mission rest upon the introduction into primitive societies of the universal language that could elevate human thought to the highest level of abstraction, something that the native tongues could not do, stuck as they are with the concrete, the present, the immediate. It is always the same divide that is found between the logos and the tongues of the barbarians. 
the language of reason, science, theology, and the so-called primitive one. Remember, we mentioned and we read passages from Macaulay last time. <coughs> The question of the sacred language is to be understood as that of a language made sacred. The miracle of vertical translation is such if and only if it is assumed that the Arabic language had precisely absolutely no pretension in itself to distinction. Inimitability is precisely that the eternal word of God could pick up one human all too human language, one that the many spoken, uh, uh, one of the many spoken by those whom the teacher in the ambiguous adventure calls lumps of earthly mold. Then inimitability will not by any means signify untranslatability or characterizing certain languages as pagan. Senegalese poet in the wall of language and uh, I decided to go in that direction after having had this exchange with Usman uh, uh, during my last lecture or the previous one. Senegalese poet in the world of language, Serin Musaka, have confronted in his works the notion that speaking of divine realities or chanting the prophet of Islam in a language other than Arabic is not appropriate. He has thus written the following lines and although we are probably only three here, if my, if my Gambian student friend is here, I do not resist uh, the temptation to quote it in Wolof first before translating it. After all, my text being about translation, we need to hear also the language of the gods, which Wolof is. Wolof Bab Arab Pukere Waham, Dena Wah Sirin Tuba, Lutah Ab Arab Wedam, Turup Wolof Ab Akbub Yaram, Akwah Yopayam, Lujok Nir Rasulullahi, Batin Basaf Haram. So now I translate. He is saying this Let me tell this to those who claim that Wolof is not suitable, understood for sacred matters. On the Day of Judgment, when the Arab language comes bragging, I will ask Serin Tuba. Serin Tuba is one uh, uh, Senegalese uh, leader of a Sufi tariqa, who is white, very respected as a founder of uh, this tariqa. Although he only wrote in Arabic, all his works are in Arabic, he sort of, in, in, the, in, the, in the movement, the religious movement he has created, he inspired many people to write in Wolof about uh, sacred matters. So I will ask Sirin Tuba, what gives Arab, Arabic its distinction? Versification in Wolof or in the noble language. Now, the noble language is Arabic, but it is noble because it is the language of the Quran, not because it is, in its essence, uh, uh, noble. Or in any other language is the same. As a language rises for the sake of the messenger of God, its essence achieve nobility. I am very interested in this very nationalist, linguistic nationalist reaction of Serin Musaka, because it is not just absurd nationalism. He is saying something very profound about the fact that sacredness is something to which, which a language goes by means of translation. When he says that as a language rises for the sake of the messenger of God, in other words, translating sacred ideas uh, uh, relative to the messenger of God, its essence achieves nobility. Nobility is something that is achieved by a language and not something that is intrinsic to any uh, uh, language. Literally, the expression he uses would translate literally its hidden genius becomes salty. It's very poetic way, and this is what I have translated as its essence achieves nobility. And this prosopopé of languages, languages just presenting themselves on the day of judgment together. And this poet, this wall of poets saying, well, 
I want to claim a precedence for my own wall of language uh, in the face of, let's say, Greek, German, and all these other languages, is a very interesting way of saying that actually sacredness doesn't belong uh, 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 to any language in particular. And my last point will be to read those lines by Musaka in connection with a historic text, which is a classic of translation studies, of course, Martin Luther's 1530s open letter on translating. In that text, as you know better than me, because you know it in German, Luther is very polemical and sarcastic against the papist, the papist who have the nerve of judging his translation of the Bible. I discovered reading this text that Martin Luther was quite a polemist. If I, Dr. Luther, he wrote in particular, had thought that all the papists together were capable of translating even one passage of scripture correctly and well, I would have gathered up enough humility to ask for their aid and assistance in translating the New Testament into German." Uh, end of quote. This is not without similitude with the Quranic challenge to actually come up with one single verse comparable to the language of the book. Far from being able to come up with a comparable translation, Luther says, his detractors are in fact repeating his own translation without acknowledging it. And I quote Luther again, they are stealing my language from me, a language they had little knowledge of before this. And he adds, it is obvious that they are learning to speak and write German from my translation, end of quote. <coughs> As I see it, Luther is not simply boasting about, he, about himself, uh, uh, um, even if he uses the very word to boast and declares that he could do that. He is, in fact, aware that his translation is a founding event, and that what is thus founded, literally created, is the German language itself. What Luther is saying to the papists, as he calls them, is that they cannot do otherwise than use the language he has instituted, because that is what the translation of the sacred does. It institutes a language and makes it become sacred somehow. And in his own way, with his own image of saltiness, the Senegalese poet Musaka is saying the same thing, namely the institutive function of translation. He holds that there is an absolute equivalence of all human languages. None has been chosen over the others for some distinctive intrinsic attribute. It remains a language among others. At the same time, the book has instituted Arabic as sacred, but any language that is touched by the message or the messenger through translation sees also its essence achieve nobility and sacredness. It becomes salty, or translation reveals to the receiving tongue its own saltiness. Arabic is the language of the Quran for all Muslims, so Muslims will not be reading it or praying in any other language than the language of the Quran itself. That being said, there is not such a thing as a language of Islam, or rather, all human languages are then. That is ultimately the message of the scene between Sambayalo and his teacher, to love the words for themselves, their music, with, uh, which is also their meaning, before their meaning itself, which belongs to no language in particular. That explains the liturgical value of the Quran in Arabic that explains the love of Samba Yalo for the somber beauty of the words that he does his utmost to pronounce as God himself pronounced them. Thank you.